Good evening. This is my Wednesday night Bible study. My name is Douglas Griffin. We are studying the book of Luke. We're in Luke chapter 10, going through the Bible. On Wednesday nights, we go through the New Testament, did Matthew, we did John, now we're doing Luke. We will do Acts, the book of Acts, because Luke wrote both of those, and then the book of Revelation. Um, and then we'll do more. <laughs> That's what's coming up. Okay. So in Luke chapter 10, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for those who've been waiting. Uh, Luke 10, verse 21. It says, In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. So you've hidden these things from the know-it-alls, the wise and prudent. And reveal them to babes, to the innocent in mind. Um, what things? What things? So, uh, in Luke chapter 10, earlier, verse 17, it says, Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So here's what has happened. Uh, Jesus sent out his 12 apostles and gave them authority over demons, gave them a th uh, and to, told them to heal the sick, and they're kind of his advance men. I'm, about, I'm going to come to the cities, these various cities, but you will have gone before me and preached the gospel, and then when I show up, you'll say, and this is the person who you've been talking about, and then I'll be able to preach to them and win them over. Um, so he sent out 12, then he sent out 70. So there are 12 apostles, there are 70 disciples. But when the 70 disciples came back, who he had not given authority over demons and everything, they said, wow, even demons are subject to us. And Jesus explains why. He says, well, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Um, and it's similar to language that is used in Revelation chapter 12 when it says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. In the book of Revelation, John, who wrote the book of Revelation, wrote in chapter 12, he has this vision and he says, And war broke out in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and his angels. So the dragon is not really a dragon that was in heaven, but that's just the name for the devil. That's a metaphor for the devil. The dragon and his angels, and they fought. But they did not prevail. The dragon did not prevail. Nor was place found from them in heaven any longer. Oh, okay, you got to leave because you showed your behind, so you got to leave. Um, so, <laughs> so the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old, the devil, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. So when Jesus says, I beheld Satan fall like lightning from heaven, this is probably what he's talking about. He was there, saw the whole thing happen. Um, this probably didn't just happen once the disciples left. Well, while you were gone, let me tell you what I saw. This probably happened a long time ago. I had told you last week that in Jude chapter 1 and also in 2 Peter, chapter 2, but I'll read from Jude chapter 1, verse 6, it says, and there's only one chapter in Jude. So verse 6 says, the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, uh, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of that great day. So it says a third of the angels followed the devil. They were kicked out. But those angels they're reserved in chains of darkness until the judgment day. And so the question is, well, then what are demons? If they're not the fallen angels, what are they? Because those angels are in chains reserved in darkness. But there are demons because they just cast them out. We cast those demons out like the demons had to listen to us. What are demons? And again, I will get to that on a different teaching. because it, it takes a whole day just to go over that. Uh, but when they came back and they say to Jesus, wow, 
the demons had to listen to us too, even though you didn't give us authority of demons. For some reason, the demons had to listen to us. He says, well, I saw Satan fall from heaven a long time ago, but he's been trapped on this earth. Well, here's what has changed. Because of my particular ministry, there's a change now. And in John chapter 12, verse 31, he says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the rule of this world will be cast out. He said about the devil, because so when the devil fell, he kind of became the god of this world's thinking. He can't control the seas and all that stuff, but he can control the world's thinking. So there are people who are following him. They're, they're creating all these idols and anything other than the worship of the true God. Anything that happens on this earth other than worship toward the true God is satanic inspired. God is somehow influ influencing their thinking. People don't even know. Some people know. Some people are like, we worship the devil. They'll just tell you straight out. But a lot of people are worshiping other things and don't realize that it's satanic inspired. But Jesus is saying, no longer will, will devil control most of the thinking that's going on. Because once my kingdom starts to spread, I'll be controlling most of, not controlling, but I'll be the major influence of the thinking. You'll, you'll just, you're going to see this grow. So no longer will the majority of the world be in darkness. But as this light grows, then the power dynamic is going to switch and people will be thinking more about God and this Christian doctrine will spread and people will understand you shouldn't kill, you shouldn't steal. This, this is going to spread across the earth. There's going to be a new way of thinking. But how this plan is initiated, God has hidden. So interestingly enough, the devil thinks, oh, I can't wait to get Jesus on that cross. That'll show him. <laughs> I'll have victory. But from the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, back in Genesis chapter 3, God gives away his plan and says, from your seed, woman, of the seed of woman, the Messiah is going to come and he's going to crush the devil's heel. Uh, I mean, with his heel, he will crush the devil's head. His heel will probably get crushed too. In the, but I, the picture is the devil this, uh, the, being smashed by something that Jesus is going to do. So the devil's waiting around to see what is it, what is it, what is it? So when Jesus shows up, his plan is to get Jesus on that cross, which is the exact thing that's going to make him lose everything. Because when Jesus goes to the cross... Now redemption is for everybody. Now, because right now there's one, when Jesus is talking right now, there's one righteous person on earth. It's him. Once I go to the cross, this will spread. This righteousness will now be able to spread through the Holy Spirit. But he says God's hidden these things. He's hidden these things. So um, when, the, when the people are, when they come back to Jesus and say, wow, uh, even the demons are, are subject to us. He says, yes, I saw, uh, I, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky. So behold, verse 19 of Luke 10, I've given you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall, shall by any means hurt you because this is the start of that new age. Nevertheless, don't rejoice in this. Don't be like the, the devil and think, oh, I can't wait to start casting out demons and make that your sole focus that you forget what it's all supposed to be leading to, which is salvation. Because everything that we do is supposed to lead to salvation. But sometimes people can get so caught up in being able to bind things and cast things out that they think that's the goal. And the goal is to get people saved. Because on Judgment Day, that begins eternity. Life doesn't end. That's when life really begins. That's when forever begins. And people will either forever be in the presence of God or forever be in darkness. And so, and that's like forever. <laughs> so uh, uh, people who think you only live once and I've got to get all the good stuff from this life and then I'm dead. Like, no. Then you just, when you die, you really just be, are beginning life. You're just entering into eternity at that point. So it is important where your soul ends up. <laughs> So that's why he says, don't rejoice in this power that you have, but rejoice that your names are written in, in heaven. Now, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus says this interesting things. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, 
but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You're, you're not under the law. You're not under my law. You're not under my command. You've been making that stuff up. You've been casting out devils and doing all these mighty wonders. And I don't, not in my name. I didn't send you to do that. I don't know you, never knew you. You are people who just decided, again, got caught up in the excitement of, and he's not talking about Christians who are doing these things. He's talking about just normal people who saw someone literally sent by Jesus to cast out demons or whatever and thought, ooh, I want that. And you were attracted by the power. You were attracted by the mysticism and and so, no, you didn't cast all demons in my name, which means by my command. I never sent you. I don't know who you are. I mean, I know who you are. But I, we have no relationship. So, And that's like finding somebody has stolen your identity and is writing checks in your name and using your credit cards. Like, I don't know who that person is. I didn't send them to do that. That person has no authority to use my credit card and, and my Facebook page and, and my checkbook and that that person is doing all sorts of stuff and I did not give them permission to do that. And that's what Jesus is saying. So he's saying, be careful that you don't get caught up in all of that. Uh, so that's two extremes he's talking about. The real plan has been hidden from the devil. The real plan is getting to the cross. But none of these people get it. No people know that plan. That's been hidden. But once they see these exciting things, they're going to be excited about, ooh, let's cast out devils and let's do, because they're caught up in the excitement and yet they're missing the real plan is me going to the cross and the most important thing is salvation. Okay, so in Luke chapter 10, verse 21, it says, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and the prudent, which he means the people who think they know everything and revealed them to babes. Those people who've just stayed innocent and are really just trying to find out what does God want? That's who these things are being revealed to. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. So all things have been delivered to me by my Father. So it seemed good to, for you to hide these things. So the whole plan of salvation has been delivered to me. The prophets have been explaining it for a thousand years but people haven't gotten it. They've just seen bits and pieces of it. And that's how God has done it, giving this one person a piece and that one person a piece and this person. Y'all have a piece of a puzzle. It's like there's, let's say there's a hundred pieces of this puzzle and each prophet and each scribe and each, they each have one piece. But Jesus is saying, I've got the whole plan. I know what the whole puzzle is supposed to look like. So that is what I am now explaining to you, but you have to listen to me. All things have been delivered to me by my father. Uh, in Matthew 28, verse 16, um, Jesus said at the end of his ministry, after he'd already rosen, rosen, been risen from the dead, uh, he's, exp he's explaining this further to his disciples because, again, they didn't think he was supposed to go to the cross. When the soldiers showed up to take Jesus to the cross, the disciples fled like, oh, no, everything's messed up. Because even though Jesus is explaining the plan to them, People just didn't get what he was talking about. They didn't get it. Yeah, 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 all that's great. But Jesus, you're going to come and you're going to destroy our enemies. And so that means the Romans. He said, no, your enemy is dead. That's who I'm destroying. No, no, <laughs> you're going to destroy the Romans. Like they didn't understand. So he's explaining this to them, but he knows they're not getting it. He's saying, I'm really the only one who gets it all. So once he's uh, been resurrected from the dead, now he's explaining to his disciples in Matthew 28, verse 16. It says, the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. So this is the mountain where Peter, James, and John had seen the resurrected Christ. They'd seen his body. He gave them a preview. Here's a sneak preview so that when it happens, you'll be able to hearken back and go, oh, now I'm getting it, right? Everything that you taught to me will make, everything I'm teaching you, Jesus is saying, will make much more sense after I'm resurrected. So I'm just giving you a preview of it. So they go to that mountain in Matthew 28, verse 16, verse 17, it says, and when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted like, oh, there he is back on the mountain again. Now we get it. 
So they worship him, but some doubted. Like, is that Jesus? I don't get it. Verse 18, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on, on earth. So now it's official that I've conquered death. I've conquered hell. I'm able to hand out everlasting life to people. I was handing it out to people before like uh, a, a contract you might sign to occupy the house. You aren't actually in the house, but you got the contract, but you don't have the house. But you got the contract that say that you own the house. Now you're actually moving into the house, but you had the contract before and it belonged to you, but you just didn't see it realize you, you hadn't moved in yet. So Jesus says, now you can actually enter into the house, but you, but I gave you the contract before, but you didn't know what it meant, which is the piece of paper to you. What is this? Now that you see the house, you're going, oh, I get it now. Right? So Jesus is saying to them a second time, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Now he said that beforehand, but now that now they kind of get it better. So go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. By making disciples, he makes teach them the same things I'm teaching you. Oh, well, it says that in the next sentence. Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. So I will be able to back you up. Uh, when I was with you, I, I backed you up by being in your presence and feeding the 5,000 and walking on water and healing the blind. But now I can send you out separately because I'll be with you through the form of the Holy Spirit now and I'm, I'll be with and that and it'll just spread and spread and there'll be a hundred disciples and there'll be a thousand and there'll be a million and then like today there's a billion you, you know so uh it's just going to spread and spread and spread and spread and spread and I'll be able to be with each individual person the same way I'm with you okay so he says to them back to Luke chapter 10 all things have been delivered unto me by my father now, he's saying this before the resurrection, so they're not quite knowing what he's talking about. Afterwards, it was easy to understand. And he says, and no one, in verse 22, no one knows the, who the Son is except the Father. And who the Father is except the Son. Like, only God gets me right now. I'm here talking to you, but you don't totally get who I am. That my purpose here is to die. And, and that I am the promised Messiah and then when I die, I'll be able to spread even farther. My power will be even greater than before. You don't, only the Father gets that. He says, no one knows who the Son is, really, except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son. Like, you guys don't get who God is, really. Now, John, after the resurrection, in John chapter 1, verse 18, he kind of tries to capture this idea. Uh, he repeats the same thing, but he's saying this now to Christians. This is 30 years later when he's writing the Gospel of John. He says, John 1, 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father right now, he has declared him to us. Everything that Jesus did was God's declaration, was his declaration of who the Father is. No one really has seen God. No one sat up to God, okay, okay, let's have some tea and let me, tell, tell me your story, God. No one's ever sit down and just have this conversation with God. But everything that Jesus did did that was him declaring God to us so he says no one who no one knows the son except the father and no one knows the father except the son and the one to whom the son will reveal him so I am slow and he's talking about his disciples no one really gets God except me no one gets me except God but because God God is helping me reveal himself to you you've been chosen no one else in this earth really gets it but I, you're able to get a glimpse of it. You're the ones whom God is revealing him right now. And he's saying this to the disciples, and they're still kind of just barely getting it. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So you, you won't understand God unless you come through me, and then you'll be able to get a bigger understanding of who the Father is. And, and this is going to happen, he basically told them, after I die, after I'm resurrected, resurrected and the Holy Spirit is in you, then all these things that I'm saying, boom, oh, I'm getting it better. I understand who God is and what his plan was much better now. Right now, he's just scary cloud in the sky that thunders. That's, my only, that's their only image of God. He came down in Mount Sinai. He thundered in lightning, and they said, no, God, get away from me. And that's their image of who God is. That's all they know. 
we see him much more clearly. Oh, I understand that he's a light and he's a door and he's a lamp to my pathway and he's the caring shepherd like a shepherd cares for a sheep and he's the father like a, we, we, we have better understanding of him now. But Jesus said to them, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. You won't understand him unless you listen to my words. Verse 7, if you had known me, then you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Like, you'll think back later and go, oh, everything Jesus said, everything that he did, he was demonstrating God to us. That's why if we want to understand God, because people say a lot of weird things about God, you have to look at Jesus' life. You have to look at what he said and what he did. And that's God. The people that he forgave, people he hung out with. We think God hates sinners. And we, we, so we, oh my God, look at those sinners over there. God's so upset. No, Jesus ate with sinners. So he's demonstrating God to us. You, if you look at what Jesus did and what he said, the people he was really mad at was the religious people who were misrepresenting God. Those were the people that he was always yelling at when he was yelling at people. People he kicked out of the temple were not the prostitutes and the drug dealers and uh, he was kicking out the religious folk because they were presenting the wrong image of God to the people and people were not coming to God because they thought he was the way that these people were representing him and just like you got to get out of my church because you're making people think that you got to buy your way into heaven that and that you know there's it costs this much money and then God will forgive you and all that no salvation is free it just takes your belief so get out of here. You're turning the house of God into a den of thieves, and you're really robbing people of, of their chance to see God. But other than that, God, Jesus spent most of his time eating and drinking with quote-unquote sinners because he wanted them to know that God loved them. For some reason, we often want God, people to think that God is mad at them. But that is not how he is. So he says to the disciples, if you have seen me, if you had known me, you would have known the Father awful, also. And from now on, you do know him and you have seen him. And Philip said to him, well, Lord, just show us the Father. And that's sufficient. Like, just show us the Father. Yeah. And Jesus said, bruh, <laughs> have I been so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? What are you talking about? I talk about him every day, and the thing, and he goes on to say, what you see me doing, that's the Father doing his work. What you hear me saying, I am saying God's words. So if you, that's what I'm saying to you. Whatever you see me do, whatever you see me, hear me say, that is God's will. So we just need to examine Jesus' life. We don't have to make it up and guess about it. When Jesus went and forgave the woman who was caught in adultery, that's God. That's how. That's what God would have done. That's because He was God on Earth. We want, you know. Anyway, okay. So, back to Luke chapter ten, verse twenty-three. Then He turned to His disciples and said privately, "Blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings had desired to see what you see, and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear, but have not heard it." So you're blessed because they've been prophesying about this for a thousand years, but they've only seen pieces. I am sure I'm literally God put on this man suit and is here talking to you and revealing himself to you. And the prophets only saw a piece of this and a piece of that. But what you are seeing is God being demonstrated to you bodily, vocally, visually, physically to you. Now, behold, a certain lawyer. This is a scribe. It's not, he wasn't really a lawyer who tries cases. Uh, but there were lawyers in the church who, it was their job to parse the words of the Old Testament and really keep track of all the laws and everything. They kept track of the laws. The Pharisees kept track of the traditions. Here's a tradition. We do this. Why don't your disciples do that? And Jesus says, because that's just a tradition. That has nothing to do with the word. But the scribes, the lawyers, they knew the word backwards and forwards. They had nothing. They didn't care about the traditions, but they were going to get you with the words. If you were off on any part of the law, they were going to trap you and say, "Ha ha, you missed it here." So a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, because that's their job: is to test everybody and, and make sure people feel bad because somewhere they're missing it. Christians think that that's their job today. 
is to make sure people feel bad. <laughs> Here's where you're missing it. This is where you're wrong. Ha. Okay, so he stands, he's going to test Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, he's already got the whole dialogue in his mind. You know what Jesus is going to say to him, he's going to say back, and then he knows how he's going to trap Jesus and say, Ha, but what about this? Okay, so he says to him, Well, what's written in the law? What, what is your reading of it? Because he's waiting for Jesus to quote something so he could say, but what about this? But instead, Jesus says, you tell me what's written in the law. He says, okay, I was prepared for that. So he answered in verse 27 and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. Now, he's quoting to him two different verses in Deuteronomy, which every practicing Jew not just the Pharisees, not the, they had to say this every morning and say this every night. That was a tradition, but it's not a bad tradition to quote from the law. They would just like you might get up every morning and say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. They got up every morning and they quoted two verses, uh, two, two sections from Deuteronomy. First, they did Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. That's Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. And then they would say, they would quote Deuteronomy 11, chapter 13 and 14, verse 13 and 14. And it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain that you may gather in your grain, your new wine and your oil. So they would say, hear, O Israel, love the Lord with all your God, with all, with all your God. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And if you serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will give you rain for your land. So they would quote these verses. So make sure if, that they were doing these things. I'm loving God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. And then he's going to bless me. So they would say that every morning and every night. There are people, and which is fine, not saying it's good or bad, who get up and quote verses every day. They'll, they'll find some verses to quote, and these are the promises of God that I'm holding on to. You know, and so whatever, you know, whatever verses that they pick, which is fine. That's what they did every morning. So he simply quoted back to him what every good and promising Jew would do every morning. But then he added this part. And this is not part of what they did every morning, but he's anticipating what Jesus is going to say. And he says, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now that's from Leviticus 19, 18. They did not, practicing Jew did not do that every morning, but he threw it in because he knew Jesus was going to throw this at him. Leviticus 19, 18 says, you shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So in Leviticus, God is teaching people three things. Because this is in the 12, year 1200 BC. He's taking them out of Egypt and he's saying, the only way to preserve you alive for the next 1200 years until the Messiah comes, you got to do these three things. You got to love the Lord your God. So I'm going to teach you to not have any idols. I've got to teach you to love your Lord your God. You got to love one another as yourself. So you don't take vengeance. If somebody accidentally runs into your horse or you don't kill them. You don't steal from them. You don't destroy them. You love them as yourself. You treat them the way you would treat yourself. You forgive them. You have mercy because you guys cannot be hating each other. If you don't love me with all your heart and you start worshiping other gods, I will have to destroy you. If you don't love your neighbor with all your heart, number two, then you'll destroy each other. And if you don't follow certain laws as far as how you eat, what foods you eat, and things like that, then you will destroy your own bodies. Nobody else will need to destroy you. So he told them certain things to eat and not eat. He told them a certain way to treat their neighbors so that they don't destroy each other. And then he told them a certain way to love him so that he didn't have to get them out and destroy them. So these are just three areas that God told them in the book of Leviticus. So they quote the first part, love the Lord your God with all your heart. But he throws in the second part about loving your neighbor. Because he anticipates that Jesus is going to do that. So, in, verse, in Luke 10, verse 28, Jesus says to him, Well, you have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. You will have eternal life. Luke uh, chapter 10, verse 29, he says, But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, Well, and who is my neighbor? 
because his whole purpose was to trap him from the beginning. It's just said that two verses ago. He's doing this to test Jesus because I've got to prove that you're the, a false messiah. That's my job. Is to, you know, and people think that's their job in life is to trap people. Ah, you said this. So he, want, he wanted to justify himself, said Jesus, and who's my neighbor. Now, later on in Luke chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus addresses his whole attitude of wanting to trap people and to justify themselves, justify themselves. So in Luke 16, 15, he says to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart. So he means there are certain things that you're doing to make sure you look good in front of other people. Like he was trapping Jesus, so all the other Pharisees would go, oh, you got him. You, good for you. Uh, because you, he says you look to justify yourselves before men. But God knows your heart. For what is highly seen among men is an abomination in the sight of God. What you think is important, like how much money you have. Oh, this proves I'm better than you because I'm so rich. Or this proves I'm better than you because I can quote the whole book of Genesis. Doesn't make you better than anybody. I, I studied the Bible because I'm a minister, that doesn't make me better. <laughs> God doesn't love me more than somebody else just because, because I've studied the Bible. That's just the particular thing God called me to. But that doesn't make him love me more than anybody else. I'm not better than anybody else. I'm not more righteous than anybody else at all. Just because I know. So, you know the Bible. Well, that's because I'm supposed to know the Bible. So this person's a doctor. Okay, that's what God called them to do. That is making them better. This person is rich. Okay, God called that person to, a, you know, have gave them certain money. He's not better than somebody who's poor. The, that that meant that pastor is not some better than somebody who was a, a drug addict or so, you know no, no we are all equal in God's eyes but he says you're justifying yourself before men but what is highly seen among men and when men go oh look you've got a big car or you've got this or you've got that or you've got 18 wives or whatever he says it's an abomination so I've God. God doesn't care because he's looking at your hearts and that's all God cares about so that's why Jesus says two men went to the temple to pray one went and got up and bragged about himself. I thank you, you, oh God, I give all my tithes, I pray twice a week, I do all these incredible things. And then this other person just said, God have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. And Jesus, it's that guy who went away, justified by God, not the one who was bragging, because he was just doing that to impress people. So he lost points with God. If you're, do, if you're living your whole, your whole life to impress people and not to impress God, well, you've got your reward. Everybody applauds you. But God's going, oh, it's too bad you're going to hell. But I'm so glad you got all that applause from those people. But you never gave me your heart. You never gave me your heart. You just created this whole life with that impress of the people. But you never gave me your heart. So Jesus answered in Luke 10, verse 30. He answered and said, because he's, well, who's my neighbor? Ha <laughs> ha, I got you. I'm supposed to love my neighbor. Well, who's my neighbor? And he, he had his answers ready to go. Whatever Jesus said, whoever your neighbor is. Because at that time that the law was given, they thought, well, my neighbor's person living next door to me. But I can hate somebody two blocks away, but I've got to love my neighbor. Okay, fine. The person who lives next door to me, I will love. But that person in that next village, nah. -uh. That person in that next town, no. We do the same thing today. Okay, I love people in my city. All of the people in my state, but that other state that's a different color than my state, hate them. Those other people who are doing those other things that we don't agree with how our state does it, hate them. Oh, those people in that other country, ah, don't like them. No, sorry. The people who are, <laughs> so we, we've decided who we, we love this group, not that group. Jesus is like, nah, sorry, you're wrong. So he answered and said, a certain man went down from Jericho to Jerusalem and fell among thieves. Uh, now, again, people in Jerusalem hate the people. Jericho is in the Samaritan area, right? In, in fact, you've got to go through Samaria to get to, to Jericho. And uh, we hate those people. So they're, they're already horrified that Jesus starts this story. A certain man fell among thieves who stripped him of his, who stripped him, not stripped him, but stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And it was a kind of a dangerous walk from Jericho to Jerusalem. So they understood, yeah, that's why I don't go to Jericho. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he just passed by on the side because he was like, no. Nah. A Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the side. This person is from Jerusalem, and yet these people from Jerusalem are stepping over that body. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Now, He's having compassion on a person from Jerusalem. People who live in Jerusalem 
hate the Samaritans and likewise Samaritans hate Jerusalem. That's why when Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, she said to him in John 4, 9, then a woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink of me? A Samaritan woman, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. You've hated us for, oh, at least six or 700 years. So no. In fact, in Luke chapter nine, what had just happened, this is another reason why Jesus is telling the story because this has just happened. Uh, when Jesus sent messengers before his face, Luke 9, 52, and as they went, they entered the village of the Samaritans to prepare for him, but they did not receive him. The Samaritans did not receive Jesus because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. He was already going to go to Jerusalem, and they're like mad, like, no, you're saying that Jerusalem is the holy place, and we believe in Samaria is the holy place, so we're mad at you, so we're not going to receive you, Jesus. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, just as Elijah did? Because these are the people, and these are the people. That is the area where they were worshiping, uh, I'm going to call her Hephzibah, Jezebel, and her husband, uh, they were those people, you know, and worshiping Baal and all that. They, those are their ancestors. So that is that area. And, and Elijah did rain down fire. Now, these people aren't just openly worshiping Baal anymore. But it doesn't matter. You used to worship Baal, so we hate you. Because it's more funner to, it's more funner. It's more fun to maintain these grudges, things that people did 50 years, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. It's really fun to dredge up the past and still hate people. You know, it's more fun We, because then you know who your enemies are. You know who you're supposed to hate. Oh, good. I'm supposed to hate those people. So let's let's rain down fire on them just like Elijah did eight, 900 years ago because we still hate them, right? But he's turned and rebuked them and said, uh, you don't know what manner of spirit you're of. You, we don't, I'm here to save souls, not to condemn people. So anyway, the Samaritan does these things. The Samaritan helps this man from Jerusalem. And so he went to him, back to Luke chapter 10, verse 34, he bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave him to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And whatever more you spend when I come again, I'll repay you. So Jesus asked, so which of these three, the, the judge who passed by, the priest who passed by, which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he says, well, he who showed, showed mercy on him. Right. So the law says, love the Lord your God, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor. Love your, do to your neighbor just what you, if you were in the ground and, and somebody had beat you, you would want somebody to pick you up. Do that. So Jesus says, exactly, the one who showed mercy. Who is my neighbor? Anyone who needs mercy. Anyone who needs mercy. Anyone on this earth who is suffering, that's someone who I'm asking you to treat like you would treat yourself. So if it's a refugee from this country or that country, or if it's a, if it's a prostitute, if it's an abused person, if it's a this or that, if they need mercy, that's your neighbor. Anybody who needs mercy. Well, who? So who was neighbor to him? He who showed mercy. Yeah, that person who showed mercy is the neighbor. So go down and do likewise and show mercy to anybody who needs it. That's your neighbor, somebody who needs mercy. Because you want a specific answer so that you can ignore everybody else. We want to know, well, my neighbor is everybody who lives in Texas. Or my neighbor is everyone who calls himself a Baptist. Or my neighbor is everyone whose skin color is mine or whose party is mine or who is my height or is my gender. or my That's who my neighborhood, that's who I'm going to show mercy to. This is, no. Your neighbor is anybody who needs mercy, period. That's your neighbor. So if you see somebody hurting on some other part of the world or just some other part of the street, that's who is your neighbor. So verse 38, now it happened as they went and entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed her, him into her house. And I call these the hidden things, the hidden things. This is what this whole thing is called. Um, a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke never say where Martha and Mary lived. John says it because John was written so much later. John was written, possibly written after Jerusalem had been destroyed. We know the book of Revelation uh, was written um, after Jerusalem was destroyed. And it is possible 
that, oh no, the book of Revelation was written before Jerusalem was destroyed, sorry. And, and possibly the book of John was written afterwards. So the book of Revelation was written before Jerusalem was destroyed because it's prophesying what's about to happen to Jerusalem in 70 AD. And there are many scholars who think the book of John was written afterwards. So John tells us where Martha and Mary lived and where Lazarus lived because their lives were no longer in danger. Because once Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and the Pharisees heard about that, they were looking for an opportunity to kill Mary and Martha and Lazarus because that would prove that Jesus was the Messiah and they weren't having that. So when you see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Mary mentioned or them mentioned, they never say where they lived because there's, you know, no one can know this, but I'm gonna tell you this story. So he entered a certain village and there was a certain woman named Martha, but you know, there's so many people named Martha. I could be talking about anybody. And they welcomed her to her house and she had a sister called Mary, but it could be any Mary, but we know who this is, Mary and Martha, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me to serve because that's what's important today is serving this food. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you worried about and trouble about many things, but one thing is needed right now. You've got to be able to discern the time. What's the hidden thing? What is the hidden thing? Because Mary sees the hidden thing. One thing is needed right now, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. She's understood that I have the words of life right now, that what I'm teaching about what is to come, because I'm trying to explain to all you people, reveal to you the Father, and explain... I've got to go to the cross, and that's the way you're going to get eternal life. Because you, this guy came to me thinking, well, how do you get eternal life? And blah, blah, blah. He said, you're not going to be able to do that until you have the Spirit of God in you. You're not going to be able to just love everybody. Because somebody who tries to stab you or somebody who hurts you or somebody hurts you, you until the love of God is shed abroad in your heart, you're not going to be able to fulfill the law. You're, trying, you're all trying to fulfill the law. Didn't give you the law so you can fulfill it. Gave you the law to show you how much you fall short of it. So that you'll think, oh, I can never do that. And he said, right. That's why you need me in your heart. So the only, I'll fulfill the law. And then you get on, on my good works, not on yours. And so these are things that are hidden that people have not been able to understand for years. So half of you have just given up of ever making it to heaven. And half of you think you can get to heaven by living this perfect life. So you pretend to live a perfect life. Neither one of that is it. I'll live the perfect life, and all you have to do is accept my sacrifice for you. But these things are hidden, and I am now trying to explain them to you. So he says, Mary is trying to find out the, the real secret. You're just trying to make sure everybody's comfortable because you think you're going to make it to heaven by making sure everybody had ham today. Ooh, we know some Jews that make some good ham. Okay, and some good bacon. Okay, but anyway, that's beside the point. So you think that you're gonna make it in by serving this delicious meal. No. Mary's choosing that part that's important. She's certain, searching for the hidden thing. And I'm trying to explain it to you people, but you, you won't understand until after the resurrection. And so once I'm resurrected, then these words will come back to you and they'll start to have a meaning. But right now they're hidden. He says, but I thank God that God is starting to reveal it to you right now, but you'll understand it better by and by. Okay. So that is Luke chapter 10, the hidden things, the important things. Don't rejoice that you're able to cast out demons. Rejoice that you've got that hidden thing, that eternal life thing. That's the, what's important that people are not getting. And that's the lesson that Jesus is teaching the whole chapter 10 of, of that. Like, well, I saw Satan fall for like, yeah, Satan fall. And even Satan doesn't get it. It's hidden from him. He doesn't know I'm not supposed to go to that. He, he doesn't, he, he's trying to send me to the cross because he's stupid and doesn't realize that's the very thing that's going to change the world, me going to the cross. And, you know, so these things are hidden, but thank God they've been revealed to us and we now get them now that we can look back and everything Jesus said. Oh, it all makes so much sense. But to them at the time, it was foggy. But they're the, they were the hidden things and Jesus says, but I'm giving you a taste on them. But once I'm resurrected, it'll all start to make sense. All right, so make sure we are understanding what the hidden things is, the important things is, that we're, we're not focusing on the things that are not important, but we're focusing on what's going to give us eternal life. Thank you so much for listening today, and I am uh, preaching on Sundays. We are in the book of Le Le 
Numbers, help me, Jesus. We're in the book of Numbers. We, we do the Old Testament on Sundays, New Testament on Wednesdays. Thanks to those who take the time to listen in. All right, I will talk to you next week. All right, bye-bye.